uh, hear the word of the Lord, as found in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 11, starting in verse 1. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And consider today, since I am not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm, his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land, and what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day, and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord that he did. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you are going over to possess, and that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you are entering to take possession of is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And if you will in indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the late, later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens, so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, and holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon and from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread, as he promised you. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today, to go after other gods that you have not known. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering, to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim, and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, toward the going down of the sun, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the oak of Moreh? For you are to cross over the Jordan, to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And when you possess it and live in it, you shall be careful to do all the statutes and the rules that I am setting before you today. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, chapter 11, uh, what it does is it marks the midway point in Moses' second sermon. 
That sermon started all the way back at the end of chapter 4, right before we read the Ten Commandments. And it will continue on through uh, to the end of chapter 28. And so this very, very long sermon uh, divides roughly into two parts. Uh, in chapters 5 through 11, Moses gives God's people the, the general principles of what he expects. And then starting in chapter 12, which we're going to look at next week, he's going to transition into the specific stipulations, the specific ways that God's people are to live out the law in their everyday life. And it's in this, the, the next section that's about to come, chapters 12 through 26, where Moses gets into the nitty-gritty of what it's going to look like for the Israelites to live uh, in a way that honors the Lord uh, in their time and in their place. And so as we go over these next chapters over the next couple months, uh, we're going to find some rather interesting laws. Uh, if you've been in our hope groups as we've looked ahead at some of these things, um, I've heard repeatedly uh, multiple times from even Pastor Bill uh, that he's really looking forward to hear what I have to say about some of the things we read. And so uh, can I just say so am I. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see as we get there. But, uh, but anyways, uh, what Moses does here in chapter 11, uh, is he hammers home yet again the importance of obedience. Uh, and he does this multiple times. Not once, not twice, but five times. He does it in verse 1, verse 8, verse 13, verse 18, and then again in verse 32. And so literally, from the very first verse of this chapter to the very last verse of this chapter, what Moses does is he calls God's people to respond to what God has done with nothing less than their wholehearted obedience and their undivided loyalty. It's not the first time that he's done this, and it will not be the last time that he does it. And so prepare to hear it again. And so as a preacher, as kind of a side note here, as a preacher, I really sympathize with Moses at this point. Uh, mu much of what Moses does throughout this book is he repeats himself. He says the same thing in different ways uh, and, and at multiple times. And so he's incredibly unoriginal, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and in many ways, I find myself doing the very same thing week after week after week, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Much of what I do and much of what God has called me to do is to be unoriginal. It's not to be creative and to make up new things. Instead, it's to be unoriginal. And so if you've ever found yourself sitting under the preaching of a pastor, me or someone else, and you've thought to yourself, all this guy ever does is repeat himself, then take heart. You are in good company. And, and to, just to be fully transparent with you, I, I think it would be safe to say that most pastors feel the very same way about their own preaching. We find ourselves repeating time after time after time the same things week after week. Our ministry is a ministry of repetition and reminder. Our job, our calling, is not to be original, not to be creative, but instead to be faithful. To put the truth of God on repeat for the people of God. And that's because the greatest need of God's people is not necessarily new information, but regular reminders of things that we heard long ago that are so prone to forget and so prone to stray from. And so that's why God reminds us regularly of so many things. In the Bible, in, in both the Old and the New Testament, we see repeated calls for God's people to choose obedience. And he does this. God calls us to do this because we are so quick to drift and to drift into disobedience. And so the next time you find yourself thinking, maybe even this morning, why is the pastor hitting on the need for obedience yet again? Why is he doing that? Well, when you think of that question, what I want you to do is I want you to turn around and I want you to ask yourself, why am I so prone to disobey? So prone to disobey that God decided it was needful and necessary to tell me so frequently to choose and to be careful to obey his word. And so it's easy to hear a sermon or a series of sermons about obedience, but it's an altogether different matter to live out a life of obedience. And this is why Moses and really every pastor repeat themselves so often. Because as God's people, pastors included, we are so prone to stray. And we need regular reminders. 
And so to help us and to help the Israelites, what Moses does is he gives us four things to consider when it comes to God's call for obedience. Uh, these things to consider that Moses gives us were important for God's people back then, but they remain important for God's people today. And so we're going to look at them one at a time. Uh, first, Moses says, consider your past. We see this in verses 1 through 7. In verse 1, what Moses does is he issues a general call to obedience based on what he has said so far and up to that point. Uh, he says, You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments. Always. Did you catch that last word? It's a small one, but it's an important one. Always. The kind of obedience that God is after is not sporadic. It's consistent. Following God is not some nine-to-five job. It's an around-the-clock commitment. There's no such thing as a lunch break where you or I just get to clock out from living the Christian life. It is 24-7. God is not calling his people to obey him some of the time, or even, in, or even really most of the time. He's calling us to obey him all the time and in every way. Now, we're not going to camp out on this because we've got so much to cover, but it is worth asking, in what areas of your life are you holding back from following Christ fully? Are you following Christ as closely on Monday and on Wednesday and on Friday as you are following him on Sunday? As you gather here with God's people on Sundays to sing his praise, are you do the, doing the same thing throughout the week on your own? That's verse number one. Then in verse number two, Moses begins to ground God's call for obedience and what God has already done for his people. And the way that he does this is he calls them to consider the discipline of the Lord. Now, the discipline that Moses has in mind here is not primarily negative in the sense of punishment. Instead, it's primarily positive in the sense of instruction. So if you're using the ESV translation like I am, you may notice a little footnote at the bottom of the page that says this. It says something like, or instruction, uh, right next to discipline. And so one Old Testament scholar put it this way. He said, the discipline of God is the education of God whereby he taught his people both by his gracious acts on their behalf and by his acts of judgment. And so here's what that means. God's discipline does two things. It forms Christ-like character within us, but it also corrects ungodly behavior among us. And so God's dis discipline does both of these things, the positive and the negative sense, and both of them are motivated by his love for us as his people. In the following verses, what Moses does is he gives two examples of God's discipline in Israel's past. The first is positive, the second is negative. In verses 3 and 4, Moses highlights what God did for Israel while they were in Egypt. That he delivered them. They were slaves, suffering under the heavy hand of Pharaoh. They were helpless, but God heard their cry and he answered their prayer. He rescued them. And so through the plagues and through the Red Sea, God not only uh, rescued the Israelites, he also executed his judgment against the Egyptians, against their leader named Pharaoh, against their land, and also against their army. So that's what God did for Israel. In verses 5 and 6, Moses then highlights what God did to Israel while they were in the wilderness. He disciplined them. In these verses, Moses makes reference to an event recorded back in Numbers 16. And in that passage, we read about some Israelite men who rose up among God's people as ringleaders in a rebellion against Moses and against Aaron. They opposed the, the leaders that God had appointed, and as a result, they found themselves suddenly being swallowed up by, sound, by what sounds a lot like a sinkhole. And as Floridians from time to time, we know what sinkholes are like. We see them on the news and et cetera. But it, what they describe there in number 16 sounds a lot like a sinkhole that suddenly came out of nowhere and swallowed up these people. And so through his punishment of these rebellious Israelites, what God was doing was he was teaching the rest of the Israelites to trust him and not to rebel against him. And so these two lessons from Israel's past were selected by Moses to stress both the grace of God and the judgment of God. He loved his people enough not only to deliver them from slavery, but also to discipline them when they strayed from him. And so we may be fickle, but God is forever faithful. 
And so can I just tell you this morning, his love for his people has not changed. Our love for him may waver, it may wane over time, but his love remains the same. And so in motivating the Israelites to choose obedience, Moses then challenges them to remember their past. He says they were slaves, but he reminds them how God delivered them. Then he says they were rebellious, and then he reminds them of how he had disciplined them. Similarly, when we get to the New Testament, we find that the New Testament writers also regularly remind us of our past. And they do so in order to spur us on to faithfulness and to obedience. I'll give you an example. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes these words. He says, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Why? In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Did you catch that? We were once alienated from God. We were hostile. We were bent on doing evil consistently. But now, because of Christ, we are reconciled to God. We are holy and we are blameless before him. And so how did such a marvelous thing take place? How did such a drastic change occur? Christ, and only Christ. When Christ gave his life on the cross as a substitute for me and as a substitute for you, what he did was he changed our relationship with God. We were hostile, but now we're holy. We were alienated from God, but now we are reconciled to him. Paul does a similar thing as he did in Colossians 1. He does it again in, in Ephesians chapter 2 where he writes these words. And it's a bigger section, but there's just so much richness packed in them, so it's worth reading it in full. Here's what he says. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a re result of works, so that no one may boast. So what Paul does here is he paints yet another dismal picture of who we once were apart from Christ. But at the same time, he also paints a beautiful portrait of who we now are because of what he has done for us. We were dead but now we're alive. We were condemned, but now we're forgiven. We deserved God's wrath, but now we have received his mercy. And all of this because of what Christ has done. He makes all of the difference. And so when, when you and I stop to consider our past uh, and, and consider who we once were before Christ saved us, then this reminder compels us. Really, it, it catapults us into desiring and wanting to live a life that responds to God with obedience and with gratitude. And so this reminder of who we once were apart from Christ is reason enough for us to choose obedience. But Moses gives us yet another reason. In verses 8 through 17, Moses says, consider your future. Not very much original stuff here, right? To be expected. Past, now, future. So the land that Israel is about to enter into is a gracious gift given to them by God himself. It's the land of promise, the place that God promised to, to give Abraham's descendants all the way back in Genesis chapters 15 and 17. And so just as God had chosen Israel to be his special people, so he chose the land of Canaan to be the special place in which his people would live among him. And so in addition to being the land of promise, Canaan was also the land of plenty. In Egypt, crops had to be watered using man-made irrigation uh, tactics or, or, or uh, kind of technology. And so what that means is it just required a whole bunch of work in order to get a crop of fruit. But, but in Canaan, it wasn't going to be that way. There would be no need for irrigation systems. 
because the necessary uh, rain would come to them from God himself. He would pour it out directly from the sky and he would do so to water their crops. And verse 12 uh, says that Canaan was a land that God cares for and that his eyes are always upon it. The, the idea here and what we see from that verse is not so much that the land was naturally fertile. Instead, we see that God would supernaturally provide for his people's needs if only they would be careful to depend on him, to trust him, and to obey him. You see, if Israel was careful to obey God's commands, then God, then they could trust that God would take care of them. But God's blessings were not unconditional. This is brought out numerous ways throughout this passage. The Israelites couldn't just assume that God was going to bless them no matter what they did. They couldn't just do as they pleased and then expect God to provide for them. If they turned away from him and if they started to chase after false gods, then God would stop providing for them. That's what he promised to do. Look again at verses 16 and 17. He said, Take care lest your heart be deceived and, turn, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. And so here's what he's saying. The land that God promised to bring them into was the same land he would take them out of if they were not careful to obey him. If they turned away from God and turned towards false gods, this fruitful, well-watered land would quickly become a fruitless and barren land. And so these verses not only warn the Israelites not to miss out on the blessing of living in God's land, they also encourage the Israelites to look forward to their future in that land. And so if we step back and we look at the whole Bible, what this does is we see that, the, that the, really the Bible, the whole story, what it does is it does a similar thing when it talks about heaven. The Bible warns everybody not to miss out on the blessing of living with God in the place that he has set aside for his people. But it also encourages Christian to live today in light of that future day when we will be with him forever in a land much better than Canaan. Because of Christ, our future is bright. So no matter what difficulties, no matter what tragedies or hardships you may face in this life, you can have the hope of heaven. And that hope can help you to endure and to persevere. This is, what Paul, this is how Paul puts it in, in Romans chapter 8. I love this. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is being that is to be revealed to us. Paul says the same thing in the op or Peter says the same thing in the opening of his letter in a little bit longer form. This is what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then catch this. To an inheritance that is un imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's grace are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Christians throughout history have found great comfort in thinking often and thinking deeply about heaven. But my fear today is that most of God's people, because of comfort, because of feelings of security, we don't think about heaven as much as our predecessors did. We've grown far too comfortable, far too complacent. And so we don't think often enough about the promise of heaven. And yet this hope of heaven gives us strength to endure the hardships that we face and to do so not only begrudgingly but to do so joyously. And so what, what both Paul and Peter experienced in their life was great suffering and they, did, and they suffered on account of Christ but they suffered gladly knowing that in the light of eternity 
the struggles and the hardships of this early, earthly life are short and they're fleeting. And so they desire to live every moment of their lives making much of Jesus. The hope of heaven loomed large in their lives and it ought to loom large in the lives of all of God's people, even up to today. So consider your past, consider your future. Now in verses 18 through 25, Moses says, consider your present. He's saying in light of what God has done and in light of what God will do, how will you now respond? He's asking essentially the question, will you treasure these precious truths in your heart? And will you teach them to others? And so much of what we read here in these verses is a repetition of what Moses has already said multiple times. But he brings them up, these words up again here as he closes out this part of his second sermon because he wants to emphasize for us their importance. And so what I want to do is not focus on all of them, but I want us to, to hone in more specifically on verses 18, 19, and 20. Because I think that's the part that we need most to be reminded of right now as a church. In these three verses, Moses repeats almost verbatim, but in only a slightly different order, what he said back in chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. And just as he did there, so he does here. He hammers home the importance of treasuring God's word and of teaching it both to ourselves and to others. And so in verse 18, he focuses first on teaching it to ourselves. And look with, so look with me at that verse. He says, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now it's not clear that whether this command was originally intended to be taken literally or not. But by the first century, we, we know from history that it did, it, it did become something that was taken literally. So much so that Jesus even addressed this practice in Matthew chapter 23. We're not going to go there. I'll let you look that up later. But here's what the Jews would do. They would take these small scrolls with similarly very small, uh, you know, writing in Hebrew of these different Bible verses from Exodus and from Deuteronomy. They would write them on these small little scrolls. They would roll them up. They would then put them into the, this set of two leather boxes. And then they would take one of those boxes, they would wrap it around their arm with that box uh, facing the inside of their body towards their heart. Then they would take the second box and they would wrap it around their head, putting it right on their forehead, right above their brain. And the reason why they did this, putting it on the inside of the arm and on the center of the head, was it was a symbol that, that God's word had authority, not only uh, over our hearts, but over our minds over everything that we think and everything that we feel and everything that we do. It's a beautiful picture that, 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 that pictures something great. And yet we don't do that today in the church. And so you and I may think that putting a Bible verse in a little box and then putting those boxes on your arm and then on your forehead may be a little weird. It may sound strange if somebody showed up next week and did that. We may look at them a little odd. But can I just ask you, how many of us have a t-shirt or a hat that we wear on our bodies that, that you, know, you know, portrays or presents a Christian message. And so how easy is it for us, just like the, the Jews, to contradict uh, what we're wearing by how we are living? You see, it's easy for us to display God's word. It's much harder to actually obey that word. Now, this doesn't mean that it's bad to wear a Christian t-shirt. It doesn't mean that it's bad to wear a Christian hat. But it does mean that we've missed the point of wearing any of those items if we fail to live in light of the message that they proclaim. And one of the ways that the Jews reminded themselves of God's word was by literally wearing it. And so besides wearing a Christian t-shirt, how can we better impress God's word on our hearts and on our minds? Well, here's where I want to give uh, some really quick practical ways uh, for us on how to do that. Number one, read the Bible. As we get into the Bible, what we find is that God's word is actually getting into us. And, and so if it's helpful, use a Bible reading plan. If it's not helpful, don't. And don't freak out about it. The point is not how quickly you get through the Bible, but how frequently you spend time in it. And so make it a priority to get into God's word every day and to read it. Number two, pray through portions of the Bible. Let God's words fuel your prayers. 
Number three, familiarize yourself with the overall story of the Bible. Just picture going out, leaving church today, maybe going out to lunch or seeing somebody at their grocery store, and for whatever reason, maybe you're wearing a Christian hat or a Christian t-shirt, they say, man, I'm so glad that you're here. I saw your shirt, I saw your hat, and I've been wondering for the longest time, the Bible's a big book. Can you summarize its story for me? What is the overall story of the Bible? What would you tell them? Familiarize yourself with the overall story of the Bible. Number four, memorize verses, memorize paragraphs, or even memorize whole chapters. When I was a kid, I memorized uh, about 25 Bible verses each year at our church's Bible drill. Now, sad to say, over the years, I have forgotten most all of those, but can I just tell you that throughout my life since then, how many times I found those words creeping up into my mind in unsuspecting moments at precisely the time that I needed to be reminded of them. So memorize portions of God's word. Number five, get a good study Bible to help you dig deeper into God's word. Number six, these, these next two are super practical. Uh, number six, on Saturday night, read the passage that you're going to hear the next morning at church. Then number seven, very similar, on Sunday night, reread the passage you heard earlier that morning. Spend time getting to know God's word. Number seven, or number eight, rather. Join a small group and study the Bible alongside other believers. Number nine, read good books about the Bible that are written by trustworthy authors. And then number 10, the last one. Listen to music that echoes the, the words and the themes of Scripture. Listen to songs that allow you to sing the sweet truth of, of God's Word. And so if you're looking for a Bible, if you're looking for books to read, if you're looking for music to listen to, besides what we sing here on Sunday mornings, then what I encourage you to do is keep your eye out op open uh, over the next few weeks because what we're working on is putting together a, a list of recommended resources that will help uh, to guide our people into resources and point them in the direction of things uh, that God's people have found helpful. And so we'll be posting that uh, in the next few weeks uh, on our website. And so I encourage you to keep an eye out on that. So teach the truth of God to yourself, but then also teach it to others. In, verses 19, or in verse 19, Moses shifts our focus uh, to the importance of teaching God's word to our kids and to our families. Here's how he says it. He says, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. So the question, if I can just tell you this morning, is not whether your, your kids are being taught anything. They are being taught something. They are being discipled by somebody. The question is, who is doing the teaching? And what are they teaching your kids? And so what the Bible makes clear is that God's design for the family is that parents serve as the primary disciple makers in the lives of their kids. The church is here to come alongside. The church is here to, to come alongside and support these parents in this role. But the church was never designed to replace parents. It just can't do that. There is simply no substitute for a mom who prays with her kids every morning. There is no substitute for a dad who reads the Bible to his kids at the dinner table every day. There is no substitute for a family who gets together and sings Jesus loves me together as a family before bed every night. See, Christian parenthood is primarily Christian ministry. The call to be a parent is really the call to be a missionary and to be a missionary in your very own home. And so a preschool class at church or activity pages for our elementary aged kids during the service will never be enough. These things are good and they're helpful, but they, they were only designed to supplement what parents are already doing in their homes throughout the week. And so having said that, let me now say this. The church, the parents in our church family need you. They need your prayers. They need your encouragement. They need your support. They need you to come alongside them and help them in whatever way you can. Now, not every parent is going to choose to put their kids in our church's kids program, but what we can do is make sure that we give every parent this option. And so by not having a class for elementary kids, like, we're, like what we find ourselves in right now, I, I can't help but wonder how many opportunities we are missing out on as a church to minister to the families in our community who find us either online or by driving by and then go to our website only to find out that we don't have anything for their elementary aged kids. I can't help but wondering about what the answer to that might be. There are a few things that, that rest heavy on my heart as a pastor and that is one of them. 
the missed opportunities we have for ministry. And so the, the call to disciple kids is a call that God has given primarily to their parents, but he has not given them that call exclusively. As a spiritual family, the church has been commissioned by Christ to make disciples and to make disciples of even the youngest people among us, including the kids. And so as a spiritual family, how are we doing in this? Are we making discipleship a priority? I say it every week at the beginning of my sermons, our mission as a church is to glorify God. How? By making disciples of Jesus Christ. Are we doing that in every way that we can? Are we taking advantage of every opportunity that we have? Then in verse 20, what Moses does is he hits on the importance of teaching God's word to our neighbors and to our community. He says, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so by commanding them to write his word on their homes and on their gates, what he's doing is God is telling his people not to be secretive about their relationship with him, not to be secretive about their love for him. And so every neighbor, every friend, every visitor who comes into the home of a person who, who is among the people of God, that person ought to know where that family stands. These families were to do what Joshua would, do, would later do when he said it at the end of his book, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so more important than putting a Bible verse on a yard sign and then sticking it in your, your yard, more important than, than hanging Christian artwork work on the, uh, the walls in your home, more important than sticking a Jesus fish uh, bumper sticker on the back of your car is the importance of representing Christ well in your community and among your neighbors. And the reason for this is that the only Jesus many people will ever come into contact with is the Jesus that you model to them. When, we, when people watch our lives and they hear our words, the question is, who are they seeing? Are they seeing Christ and somebody who represents him well? Or are they interacting with somebody who contradicts not only the character of Christ, but the call of Christ? And so we must be careful to treasure God's word, to teach it not only to ourselves and to our kids, but also to our neighbors. Then in verses 26 through 32, what Moses does is he comes to the conclusion of his sermon. And what he does here is he calls each and every person to come to a point of decision. He says, consider your options. In verse 26, he says, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. Moses is going to go on uh, to elaborate on this more fully in chapter 28. And so I'll wait to say more about that in, w until we get there. But his purpose here is to stress for us the importance not only of making a choice, but of making the right choice. God is placing a choice before every Israelite, blessing or curse, prosperity or poverty, worship or idolatry, obedience or disobedience. And he's saying, choose one. More than that, make sure you choose carefully. He's saying neutrality is not an option. He's saying sitting on the fence is not an option. I don't know who came up with that phrase, but have you ever imagined what it would be like to actually sit on a fence? with one leg straddling each side, not comfortable. And so what God is saying here and what Moses is saying is choose a side. Be fully committed to the Lord or, don't, or just at least stop pretending to be partially. Make a choice. Similarly, the Bible presents us with the same choice. As we read and become familiar with its overall story, what we see in, in the big scheme of things is that God is laying before each and every one of us a choice. A choice to choose between two fundamentally opposing things. Life or death. Salvation or condemnation. And grace or wrath. And he's setting these things before each and every person. And he's saying it's not enough to sit on the fence. It's not enough to follow him half-heartedly. We must commit ourselves fully. And so not only are you to make a choice, but make sure you make the right choice, the wise choice. Just as Moses did in his day, so preachers have done throughout history when they've said, today is the day of salvation. The author of Hebrews says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He doesn't say, wait until tomorrow to make this choice. Don't, don't delay. He's saying, Figure it out. Decide it today. Settle the matter. And so if you're here this morning and you are not a believer, if maybe you've thought you've been straddling the fence and that's okay, 
Hopefully this morning you're saying that that's not enough and it's not okay. And hopefully this morning you're saying that there is a choice being set before you to choose a life in Christ or to embrace the death that we all deserve for our sin. And so the whole story of the Bible is a Bible, is the story that builds up to this very choice. And so there is a decision to make. In that decision, we're being prompted and encouraged to choose Christ. And so when we stop and we look at this chapter, when we stop and, and remind ourselves of all the things that Moses has covered, what he is doing and, and showing us what God has done in, in the past, what God will do in the future, and what he's calling to do, us to do in the present, what he's doing is he's calling us to respond in wholehearted obedience to him. And he's showing us that this God deserves nothing less he deserves our all. And so may we follow him by God's grace and follow him fully. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your kindness and your grace this morning. I pray that as we close out our time here, God, that we would not, not leave here, not move along to entertaining other thoughts in our minds until we settle the matter in our hearts of whether we are following you with every part of who we, who we are, with every fiber of our being. God, I pray in, for those areas in our lives that are in many ways serving as strongholds of sin. God, I pray that you would break those down in our lives. That, God, we would say you have full access to us. Use us and, and mold us and shape us in, in every way. God, I pray that we would be a people who hold nothing back from you. God, I pray for any here in this room that do not know you. God, I pray that they would repent of their sin, that they would trust in you that they would see what you've done for your people in their past by delivering them from slavery to sin, that you would help them to see your promise of eternal life with you in heaven, and that they would see that your calls for obedience and commitment here in the present are really understandable in light of who you are and what you've done for us. God, I pray that you would help us all to choose carefully and to choose Christ this morning. And it's in his name that we pray.